Thanks living is thanksgiving. I want to finish what we started last week, and uh, there, there's so much more to it that I wanted to share with you. I felt to share with you, and uh, this is going to be my opportunity to do just that. And uh, thanks living is thanksgiving. And we're looking at Psalm chapter 92, if you want to turn there with me. And, and you know, there's so much about what we've been singing about and, and what John read earlier in Psalm that took me right back to this psalm. As a matter of fact, I started writing things in the margin of my Bible quickly while he was reading uh, to hopefully not forget some of this stuff. And that's just the way I operate. Um, but we're looking at Psalm 92. It's a wonderful psalm. And the psalms, all the psalms, served as Israel's hymn book. Keep that in mind. Uh, they were sung in the temple. They were sung on the job. They were sung in the home. The Psalms was, were, is the biblical hymnal of the day. And um, you know, I wish we could put this psalm to, to music somehow and, and sing it. Um, but this was a, a Sabbath psalm as well. And it's the only psalm in all of the psalms that is designated as a Sabbath psalm. It was sung on the Sabbath. Most of the Jewish people, the Israelites, most of them knew this psalm. Like you know your favorite song, they knew these psalms. And it says here in Psalm 92, It is, a, it is good to give thanks to the Lord, <clears throat> to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre, for you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord. Your thoughts are very deep. Yeah. And hopefully by the, by the time we're done here today, I'll cover all 15 verses uh, with that in some short, small way. Uh, that's what I hope to do to make it all make sense for us and to do that. Father, I am nothing without you. Nothing. Nothing. Lord, I, I don't do what I do based upon my own ability or strengths. Anything that I have, you've given to me. And Father, I need you now, as in the most desperate moment of my life, I need you. And Lord, I trust you. I look to your faithfulness. I look to your steadfast love. And I know that you will be faithful to your people here. That you will communicate your truth to the heart. And I ask you, Father, that our mind, heart, soul would be focused upon Jesus. Help us to not only hear, but to understand and live these truths for Jesus Christ. Father, I ask you again, as I have thousands of times before, hide me in the shadow of the cross that only Jesus is exalted in this place. In your name I pray, amen and amen. So what does the context of Psalm 92 mean? That thanking God must become a way of life for us. I'm going to do just a quick two-minute review here. Because of who he is and all he has done and what he continues to do. God is still doing. God is still doing in our day. You say, well, I don't see it. The sun rose this morning. You're still breathing. You, you came through the night by grace, and we are given another day. You have your health. Or, you know, some of you might think, well, I have some health. Well, that's okay. God is still doing, isn't he? God is still continuing his work, and he will until the end of time. He'll continue to move. Uh, when we praise God, the psalmist here in Psalm 92 is, is calling us to praise God and to sing to the Lord. When we praise him and when we thank him, we must do so with joyfulness, There's those, there are those words again, and gladness of heart. Our circumstances may be dire. Our circumstances may be bleak. But the God we serve isn't. And He can touch the heart. And you as Christians know what it means to be joyful in grieving. To be joyful in misery. 
to be joyful in the trial. You know what I mean when I say that. We can be going through the difficulties of life, but when we are connected rightly with Jesus Christ, we have the joy of the Lord and we know that that will sustain us. And we operate and exercise in that joy. God loves to be praised and worshipped by His children. The psalmist tells us that He inhabits the praises of His people. That God is enthroned upon the praises of His people. How important is it then for us to praise and worship the Lord? Vitally, vitally important. We left off last week talking about, it, or rather, working from 1 Thessalonians 5.18, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God concerning you. In all circumstances. This refers to every circumstance that occurs in your life. And we may be thinking about what's happened in our life. This can also mean what's going to happen in your life. How's that? <laughs> Not just what you've been through, but what God is going to see you through in the, in the future today or tomorrow. We are to give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God concerning you. No matter what struggles, no matter what trials or testings occur in the lives of Christians, with the exception of personal sins, we are to give thanks to the Lord. And we are to do so motivated, energized, fervently, with joyfulness and gladness of heart. You know, at 4.30 in the morning, it's pretty hard to have a song in my heart and a two-step my, in my walk, right? But we must come to the Lord in such a way to worship Him. The Christian is to abound... In the, in, in, in the praise, rather, of thanksgiving. We are to abound. It's not just something we do once a year, right? Or once in a while. We are to abound in that. If you have an abundance of something, you know what that means. You have a lot of something. Probably more than what you need. You have a lot of it. And the scriptures tell us that we are to abound in thanksgiving. More than enough just to be Happy, joyful people in Jesus Christ. No? Okay, all right, all right. Stay with me now. All right. <laughs> Stay with me here. Therefore, tells us in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. So walk in Him. Follow Him. Be an example to other people of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. So walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith. No, this takes you beyond the, 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 what we consider a want of more faith to being established now in the faith, which says the faith we have is sufficient. God has given to each and every one of us a measure of faith, and it's enough. It's enough. We know that. The Word of God teaches us that. Jesus told His disciples, if you have the faith of a mustard seed... Why, you can do just about anything, right? And he's saying the measure of faith that he's given to us is like that faith of a mustard seed. He says, established in the faith, just as you were taught. We've all been taught. Everything we know, we were taught by somebody else, right? Everything. Everything we know, we've been taught by somebody else. Just as you were taught, we, we come to the fellowship of the believers, we listen to the preaching and teaching of God's Word here and at various other places to learn how to conduct ourselves as Christians, to live the Christian life. You know, someone who says, I'm a Christian, needs to be the example of Jesus Christ because Christian means Christ follower, right? We're to be the example of following Jesus Christ. You know, if... If I, I don't go to church, I want nothing to do with fellowship. Um, well, that's on Mondays. But if, if, <laughs> if I want nothing to do with church, nothing to do with the fellowship of believers, uh, and, and I just want to live my life according to the dictates of my standards, I'm not a Christian. I'm not. Oh, nor am I an example of Jesus Christ. We're called to be an example of Jesus Christ. Just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. The first thing out of the Christian's mouth, the first thing on our thoughts in the morning when we get out of bed and probably the last thing should be on our minds when we go to sleep at night is thanking the Lord. Thanking the Lord. Praising the Lord. 
Have you ever woke up in the morning and right out of the clear blue you're, you're singing a song? Worshiping the Lord? You know, none of that ACDC stuff. You know. We're singing praises to the Lord. You know, if I hear someone mention even the words of a song, somewhere in my psyche I'm going to sing that song. You know, it is a good thing to, to give Thanks unto the Lord. All these songs that we were singing, man, you ought to take that insert home and put it where you can see it all the time. We are to abound in thanksgiving. And, and the Christian can be thankful in all circumstances for the overarching principle that we find in Romans 8.28, right? Right? Yeah. Which assures us that God is at work for good in the lives of His children. And it tells us in Romans 8.28, and we know that for those who love God, all things, everything, all circumstances, everything, Works together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. You know, if God is working in you, all things for good, that means that you belong to him. That's a good mark of ownership. You're a child of God. God is working all things together for good to those who love him, to those who have been called, the effectual, eternal call to salvation, those who have accepted Jesus Christ and are a child of God. God is working all things together. And again, in Psalms 34, 1, it reminds us that in all circumstances we can give thanks, praise, and worship to the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Now let me ask you a question. Don't raise it, your hands and don't blurt out an answer for Pete's sakes. Embarrass yourself. How many of you live that verse of Scripture this past week? I will bless the Lord at all times. I was doing good until a guy came crowding me. I couldn't even see his headlights, right? I, I was doing good and, until someone didn't say, Merry Christmas and thank you for shopping. <laughs> I know, I'm being a little facetious here, but you'd be amazed at how many Christians get hung up on that stuff. Really embarrassing. It is. How many of you could say that this week? So you couldn't, maybe, in every situation, but today's today and tomorrow's tomorrow, and we can say that now. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. In the, not just on the mountaintop. Oh, don't, don't give me that. Come on. Anybody can praise God on the mountaintop, right? When things are going good, all is right, all is true, and, and nothing is going to interfere, we can praise the Lord. I'm with you, but wait a minute. We have to descend into the valley now. Then we're tried. Then will we say, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. doesn't say you have to appreciate the situation you're in whatsoever. You may dislike it with everything. You may loathe it. But the sacrifice comes in our praise to the Lord in it. So what does thankfulness Praise and worship and to, to the ch in the church setting now, here and in your personal life, in, in the fellowship of the Christian. What does that look like? Do you really want to know what that looks like? Huh? And I'm going to give you the scripture, uh, one anyway, there are many. You really want to know what it looks like, what it should look like here on Sunday mornings and any time we come together as a body of Christ and even in your private devotion at home tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. You know, Ephesians is always a go-to, right? Addressing one another <laughs> in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's the picture of the church. How you doing? <laughs> How we doing? Huh? Hmm. Addressing, you know, church should not be, uh, let me just give a, a, a simple foolish analogy here. Maybe you've ever been to a restaurant with a buffet. All you can eat buffet. You get to pick and choose what you eat, what you want, and you can go back 10 times. I wouldn't recommend it, but you can go back 10 times. You can just eat what you want, right? So many Christians treat church like a buffet. 
You know, we, they come to receive, get what they want without giving back. And that's sin. Here's what we are to do. We are to encourage one another. To be an example of following Jesus Christ to one another, that means loving people unconditionally. Because you, as a child of God, know what, knows what it means to be loved unconditionally. We are to love one another unconditionally. We are to encourage brothers and sisters in Christ. And it tells us here, addressing one another. Greet each other with a psalm, a hymn, or a spiritual song. Let's be careful now, okay? We need to remain, maintain composure, all right? But no, let's stay true to the word here. Singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another, listening to one another, caring about one another. You know, some of you could use a, a, a psalm or a hymn or a spiritual song. I'm just saying, you know. Therefore, it is good to give thanks to the Lord. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. The word Lord, Christ becomes the object now of our thanks, our praise, our worship. The, the Lord means one who has authority and power and seeks to have a relationship with his people. And, and this name signifies that, that he is always in control and he is accessible to his people, the Lord. There's more to it than just that as well. The Lord is the name given to Christ, the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And He desires, that should get us, He desires to have a relationship with His people. He's not a God who is far off. He's not a God who, who is going to make you wait and set up a, an appointment with him and he'll meet you six months down the road. That's if he points the scepter to you. No. Jesus Christ has become the door of access to our Heavenly Father. And without Christ, no one has access to God the Father. None. 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 Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one goes to the Father except through me, me, him. He desires a relationship with his people. He's always in control. And he is accessible to his people, and he gives to us access to the Father. You know, then here in Psalm 92, the psalmist takes us even deeper into the realm of worship. And in our identity to the Lord, when he says, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, Almost high. This signifies the exalted, supreme, and overwhelming majesty of the Lord. Almost high. To talk about the Lord in this way, now listen. To talk about the Lord in this way, to praise Him in this way, uplifts and liberates those who praise Him. Now, I don't know about you, I'm guessing you're on the same bandwagon as I am. We all need to be uplifted and liberated in our day, in our time, to worship and to praise the Lord. The Lord God Most High is liberating to us because we have access to His presence. We are assured that we are children of God. Too many of us have succumbed to the circumstance and we would remain bound in the chains of that circumstance rather than to be liberated in the spirit and truth of knowing Jesus Christ. Hmm. Christ, the Lord. You know, when we say, He's my King, He's my Lord, He's my Savior, and, and I say today, as I've said uh, uh, so many times in the past, I believe that as Christians we live far short of the glorious spiritual blessings that God has ordained for His church and for His people. Oh, we can, especially in a church setting, we can say, He's Lord. We can get all excited about that, all energized with that, 
and encouraged with that. And then we face Monday. Monday. You know, and I was working as a bivocational pastor. I drove truck for many years. And I remember what it was like on those long weeks. Friday finally got here, right? Finally, Friday arrived. You just, you, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? You have just this sense of energy and excitement. The weekend's here. I can be me. I can have, do what I want to do. I don't have, I'm not bound by this truck or the dispatchers. Oh, those dispatchers. <laughs> you know, and I, I remember praying, Lord, give me a Friday afternoon attitude. I mean, a, a Friday afternoon attitude come Monday morning. Help me with this. It was a, there was an area of my life that I really wanted victory in. Give me a Friday afternoon attitude on Monday morning. That's, that's what we need, huh? We need an attitude adjustment, don't we, at times. We really do. All of us do. No, no exceptions here. So, um, yeah. So, when we bring our praise to Him, it tells us here, to sing praises to your name, O Most High. You know, this brings our whole being into thankfulness and praise. That is... That is now a mind that in the moment, in the moment, the mind that is truly transformed to praise. Truly transformed in the moment to praise the Lord. All of a sudden, what I didn't have five minutes ago, I'm now experiencing right now. Because there's a truth that has come into my mind by the, by the word of truth and by the Holy Spirit in me. And it's igniting that, engaging me in that thought that I want to and I desire to praise the Lord. What I didn't have five minutes ago, I'm now living because there's been a, a, a short transformation. Oh, that it would be so progressive at that moment on. So it brings our whole being into thankfulness and praise and worship. Then whatever passes through the mind now aligns the heart, the soul, and the body than to be obedient to praise and worship the Lord. You think about that for a moment. And I've said it last week, I'm touching on it again. The mind. Everything travels through the mind first. You can't believe the Word of God without hearing it and believing it here. And then the Holy Spirit roots it in our heart, in our soul. We begin to live it. Hmm. And when then in that moment, I believe, even though they're sporadic moments, we want them to be a continuum. They may be sporadic in the moment. We realize that. And it, it's our heart's desire then to find that medium, that steady in following Christ. That we always are always. Have you ever had moments in prayer where it's just been exuberant? Just you and you and Jesus, you and the Lord. You've had a wonderful experience praying, and you're even singing, singing. How many of you sing when you pray? Huh? No? Well, I can tell you right now, <laughs> you're already missing this first verse, all right? <laughs> you got to get with the program. <laughs> um, and you have those wonderful moments. The, the Word, you just read the Word, and it just jumps all over you. Then there are other times where you have to get up and walk around to stay awake. You know, you read the Word, and you read the Word, and you read that, that, that verse over and over and over and over and over again. You still can't get it yet. Those, those times, they're like that. We're like that. Hmm. You know, I don't know about you. I, I think I do. I think I can say this safely, that this is what every Christian wants is, to be that man or woman that God wants us to be, that Christ is all. Christ is all in that moment, in that moment. And when we have those moments of refreshing in prayer, our devotion in the body of Christ, why do we think that has to end? Why do we think it has to end? Well, life is an interruption uh, at times, but that still doesn't end it. We can constantly live this day in and day out, always. It calls us to live in very close proximity to God. That means we cut back our time on 
social media. Now I'm preaching to myself. Maybe not so much social media as other things. We cut back on our time with watching those video shorts that are so addictive, aren't they? Huh? Terribly addictive. We get away from the television and we, we get away from the news. Uh, we start surrendering more of our time to spend in time with the Lord in prayer, in the Word. I'm telling you, you won't miss those things. You won't. You know, let them complain. You didn't answer my text last night. I tried to reach you on PM. Yeah? Well, you have more important things to do now, right? Because this is all about kingdom stuff here we're dealing with, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, when we give the good thanks to the Lord and sing praises to the name of the Most High, it is then we realize the truth that in every circumstance, praise lifts us from the misery and weariness of our sin, affliction, and trial. And it gives to us focus and perspective. It is then that we will sense experientially now the pleasure of God. The pleasure of God. Have you ever sensed the pleasure of God on your life? Huh? Eric Little, the great Olympian in the 1920s, he was a fast runner, very fast runner. And he wouldn't run on Sunday in the Olympics. And he lost one of the meets because he wouldn't run on Sunday. That was the Lord's Day. And he told his sister one time, he says, when I run, I sense God's good pleasure because he has made me to run. Oh, that we could say that in serving the Lord, right? Now God has ordained you serve him. How do you approach that? With pleasure? We could say, oh, I feel and sense the Lord's pleasure in my devotion. In these long days and hours of work and laboring and when everything is going wrong, I, I still sense the pleasure of God. God is an experiential God. He doesn't call us to himself and say, leave all your emotions over here. I'm going to just deal with your intellect. <laughs> yeah, intellect. Yeah, that's descendant academia when you come to Christ, right? Not in the sense that you lose your brain, right? God has to deal with us in our intellect because oftentimes we think that we can figure God out and we know what God wants and we devoid ourselves of faith and trust ourselves. You can't do that. You can't do that. God is an experiential God. He touches our emotions because He touches our mind our heart, our soul, our bodies, our very beings, everything about us, God wants to touch. Let me ask you a question. There's a reason I'm asking this. Don't answer it again. This is for thought, right? Do you have a desire or intent to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to His name? Do you have that desire or intent to thank the Lord in praise and worship. I'm going to ask you again, do you? And I ask that because the desire for that, the intent of the heart, which through the mind, right, to thank God, to praise and worship the Lord, is, now catch this, it is God through the Word and through His Holy Spirit touching the very core of our being and urging us in the direction of true thanks, worship, and praise. That is God, that desire and that intent. You didn't muster that up on your own to do anything good in the direction of God whatsoever. That is God through the Word and through the Spirit of God pushing you and urging you to do that. I, you know, you, you got to believe that. Because that's the word of truth. There's nothing good in me to bring to God whatsoever. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, as the song goes. But he made something beautiful of my, of your life. That's what God 
wants to do. We bring to him all our brokenness. You know, there was a song years and years ago. I remember learning it as a little boy and singing it because my dad would always play these Christian albums on the record player. For those of you who are in present-day culture, you wouldn't understand what a record player is, but... It's me again, Lord. I've got a prayer that needs an answer. It's me again, Lord. I've got a problem that I can't solve. I don't mean to worry you. And as I got older, I thought, you, we don't worry God. I don't mean to worry you, but here I am facing something new. I need help that only comes from you. It's me again, Lord. But the, it taught me one thing, that we can take anything to God in prayer. Anything. We can come to the Lord. I was singing that as a five and six year old. That was a long time ago. A long, long time ago. Hmm. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you. Now that desire and that intent, your feeling, it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So it is God working in us if we have the desire or the intent, it's God working in us both to will and to work. He's given me the desire. He's given me the intent. Same for you. To work for his good pleasure. How many of you want to please God? Huh? Not everybody. Not everybody. How, how many want to please God now? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you, you must, must please God. You must please God. It's not an option. We are to be pleasing to God. And we do that through obedience to His Word. You know, to give thanks, praise, and worship is work. It, it, is, it is godly work. And it is a Sabbath work. Yeah, what in the world do you mean by that? We're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. I know that. <laughs> Well, Matthew Henry puts it like this. I, I, I grab the whole thing here. An old Puritan minister, he says, This psalm, Psalm 92, appoint, was appointed to be sung, at least it usually was sung, in the house of the sanctuary on the Sabbath day, that day of rest, which was instituted memorial, which was an instituted memorial of the work of creation, of God's rest from that work, and the continuance of, of it in his providence. And Jesus said, For the Father worketh hitherto, I work. And he says, One, the, the Sabbath day must be a day not only of holy rest, but of holy work. And the rest is in order to the work. Two, he says, The proper work of the Sabbath is praising God. Praising God. Every Sabbath day must be a thanksgiving day. And the other services of the day must be in order to this. This is... Jesus said in John 6 and verse 29, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. That's the work of God. The work of God is in sending his own son to die for our sins, to reconcile us back to the Father. Jesus says that's the work of God. We're going to be talking about that in a few moments in, in the same chapter of Psalm 92. So I'm going back now to focus and perspective. We need focus and perspective. When our focus and perspective is right, then you'll begin to grasp that God is at work in your life through the various trials or circumstances. And you will give to Him, that is, which is the will of God, which is the will of God, fervent thanks. We'll give to the Lord fervent worship, fervent praise. We won't come to it half-hearted. We won't come to it sleepy-eyed. We'll give to Him the best. And, and when we do this, this maximizes God and minimizes all circumstances by and for our attention. I want God maximized in my life. I want God maximized in your life. I want all my troubles, all my circumstances minimized because my eyes are focused on Christ. I have a perspective of truth. That perspective is drawn from the truth of God's Word. The focus is, comes from the truth of God's Word. We need focus and perspective. True praise and worship 
will turn your eyes from your circumstance, from the trial, from testing, and cause us to look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, it tells us in Hebrews. Look to Christ, the founder and perfecter of our faith. We can always look to Christ. In every situation, we can always look to Christ. Well, you don't know what I've done. Look to Christ. Scripture says that. Look to Christ. I don't know if God can forgive me. Look to Christ because He can. I don't know if I'll ever be the same. He can restore you. Look to Christ. It's what we're called to do. To be examples of, of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. And, and when we do that, when this happens, what will people see in you then? What will people see in me then? What we've already said. They will see the example of what it means to, to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Those around us will see our life, get this, our life defined by Jesus Christ and not defined by our circumstance. Be the example of Christ. We must stop allowing our lives to be defined by our past. That's a trap of the enemy, by the way, to blind you, to hinder you, and to keep you from following Jesus Christ the way we should be following him. Hmm. Well, let me, I'll close with this. If we cannot see beyond our circumstance, if we can't, then can you truly bring thanks and sing songs of praise with joyfulness and gladness of heart to the Lord? You know the answer. No. No, we can't. We can't. We need to surrender those things to Him. huh? Well, I guess I'm not going to finish all 15 verses. I guess I'm not. A life rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith, and abounding in thanksgiving, praise and worship, that is, is a life with focus and perspective. You will be a fruit-bearing branch for God. You can read about that in John chapter 15. Oh, yeah, okay. One more question for you and I'll close. All right. I'm sorry. I know. Some of you just, oh, he's done. No. Oh. <laughs> what is it then that gives us focus and perspective? I want to give you this answer. The answer is this, to whom we are thankful and what we praise and sing about. To whom we are thankful and what we praise and th sing about. That's how we gain focus and perspective. To declare, the psalmist says in verses 2 and 3 of Psalm 92, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness in the night. To the music of the harp and melody of the lyre the lute and the harp and the lyre. So our focus and perspective is on Christ being the object of our thanks and our praise. And we sing to him. We sing about his steadfast love. We sing about his faithfulness. We declare it. We declare it. Make a declaration. Huh? I guess that's, that's to be known. A declaration is to be known, isn't it? Declare it to your family. Declare it to your friends. Declare it to your coworkers of the steadfast love of God and His faithfulness. No matter what they say, do that. I, I was thinking of a song this morning. I'll, I'll say amen with that. Amen.